Good evening and welcome to the seventh episode of HealCast. I'm Noelle Jenka and I am both a yoga teacher and a life coach for people with chronic pain and chronic illness. And I run the HealCast series to help people learn about holistic practitioners that are out there so that you can get a chance to learn about other opportunities to heal yourself and other opportunities to get support and also ask practitioners questions before you actually go and see them. So you can see who might be the best people to bring on your healing team. And tonight I'm really excited to be talking to Michelle Aubin, who's um, a holistic pain relief coach. And we're gonna be talking about how to relieve chronic pain without drugs or side effects. So Michelle, I'll turn it over to you and let you say a little bit about who you are and, and what you do. Well, first, Noel, I just want to thank you for inviting me on the show. I think the work that you do is so fantastic, and you're really getting the word out to people about thinking about healing in such a broader way. And I'm just honored to be here and share this information with your audience. So I just appreciate being here and appreciate everybody who's showing up and listening to this recording, because uh, I'm really excited to bring this information to people. So. I just want to start there. But yeah. yeah, I am a holistic pain coach. And my journey is that I suffered with chronic pain and fibromyalgia and a host of other related illnesses for more than 10 years. And I had chronic pain when I was a child. At the age of uh, eight or nine, I, I had, remember having chronic pain, going to the doctor for that. So um, back then, they didn't diagnose fibromyalgia. But um, I went through the whole cycle of dealing with doctors and not getting better on that whole journey. Yeah, and it sounds like it's been a long journey for you. I didn't realize oh, how yeah. long it had been. Yeah, I mean, some people when they look back, you know, back in the 70s and in the 80s, they didn't really understand chronic pain in children and some children have arthritis some you know it can be hard to i got diagnosed with uh, growing pains but then i looked around and said well why don't other children have growing pains it just didn't seem right yeah and thought nothing of it but then anyway you know you, you kind of go on and then i made you know made the best of it and then um other symptoms kicked in fatigue other things in my 30s it's the same story for a lot of people you mm -hmm. know um and I help. I went to the doctors. They sent me to other doctors. Um, I got put on medications. They weren't working. I got put on other medications. And at one point, I was on seven or eight medications. And actually, the symptoms of the medications were more debilitating than my illness, if that's even mm -hmm. possible, right? And there was even a point where one of my doctors said, um, there's no more I can do for you. You're going to have to learn to live with this. And I hear that from a lot of people. You know, the medications really don't cut it for chronic pain. And there's reasons for that. I'll go into that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And so that was my turnaround because that wasn't acceptable to me. And um, I determined to find a better way to live because that track wasn't helping it was actually making things worse yeah i would imagine so yeah i mean i know that's a story a lot of people go through um but that's sort of the background of my of my journey and um and then how did you become somebody who teaches other people how to heal themselves and how, to, how did you heal yourself i guess is maybe where we should start so how do you hear yourself? Well, it's a, it's a combination of things. But what I want to convey to people who are listening to this, if you or someone that you care about is struggling, hold the vision that healing is possible. That's the most important thing on a day-to-day -day basis is just to hold the vision. And you may not have all the answers. And the answers for you might be different than for someone else. So, you know, I can talk about some general concepts with chronic pain, but um, the specifics might vary as everything does. But just to hold, you know, I just want to convey that because I know there's a lot of frustration and um, I, know, I know for me, I felt hopeless at times. And I just, Noel, you're an example of healing. You know, there's so many examples of people that have 
healed and recovered and just to hold on to that and look for those stories and hold that in your mind. So that's the first sort of foundation. Know that it's possible. I love that. Even so if the medications. Yeah, it's important, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's easy to, I guess the piece around that is, um, you know, I don't want to, um, I don't want to put down the medical community, but when it comes to chronic pain, they have one tool, which is pharmaceuticals. And if that tool doesn't work, they don't have other tools. If they care about you, they're compassionate and they're highly trained. Um, so if you, if you, that one tool is not working for you, don't give up and look for other tools. And you may need to go outside of the medical industry, the mainstream medical industry to find those tools. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of uh, one of the ways I think about it. And okay, so how did I become? Well, I'm a hypnotist by training um, in, in 20 years ago or so, and I had done energy healing training and um, a lot of you know coach training, and I never focused on people with um, helping people with chronic pain per se. I help mm -hmm. people with healing. I help people with a lot of other issues, motivation, making changes in their life. But I really didn't understand the dynamics of chronic pain until I went through it and then started to relieve myself of it. And in my mind, there are a couple of factors. So before I go into them, I need to talk about the nature of chronic pain. Okay. Versus acute pain. Okay. So acute pain is defined as pain that you get from an injury or some kind of healing process. Like you, you know, you break your arm and your arm is healing. You might have pain for a few months. You might have an operation you're recovering from or even a back injury or some kind of accident or even an illness. If that pain lasts more than six months, then it's considered chronic pain. And there's a difference in the way the types of pain operate in the body. And there's a difference in the way medications can affect the amount of relief you can get. So sure. for me, it's a great for acute pain. You know, you get an operation, something like that. They're great for that. They actually can cause things to be worse in the long term for chronic pain because when you take them over time the brain stops being as sensitive and there can be a rebound effect and you can actually feel more pain yeah so yeah, I've known people that make sense? have that experience yeah and that's why people have to up their dose whether or not we're not talking about addiction we're talking about the body's pain signals getting dimmed and then mm -hmm. our nervous system going oh i need more information basically yeah and so th right that makes sense mm -hmm. okay and then another one you know a lot of research has come out about people with fibromyalgia having a um, heightened nervous system or a heightened mm -hmm. pain system so i don't know if that's true or not i i caught it but if it is true in chronic pain, in most people with chronic pain, whether it's fibromyalgia, back pain, um, any other condition, the nervous system is heightened. The central nervous system is activated. Right. And it becomes its own syndrome. Chronic pain then becomes its own sort of dynamic. And that can affect sleep, that can affect you know, and then that affects the healing process because you're not getting the sleep you need to heal, becomes this sort of cycle. Right. So those are the differences and they're really helpful to keep in mind when we talk about chronic pain in terms of the nervous system and how to calm the nervous system. And we all have the ability to do that. That's the good news. Mm -hmm. We all have the tools, right? Our bodies are amazing we when we know how to tap in and do that and I'm going to talk about that a little more today yeah yeah so so can you give us a little bit of information on on how you support people and in, in changing their relationship with pain and their nervous system and how that all yes works? 
Yeah. So, so the other part that the other part to dealing with the nervous system is dealing with inflammation. Yeah. Because pain is also related to inflammation. So right. that's been huge like for me. Say, like when I cut certain things out of my diet that caused inflammation, it was a huge game changer for my pain. Even though, even though it's a Lyme disease, Lyme diagnosis you have, you found that cutting certain foods out well, yeah, had a big I mean, impact? Yeah, because when you have Lyme, you're just like systemic inflammation everywhere. So, um, yeah, just, just yeah. dealing with the inflammation was really, really helpful for me. Yes, yeah, so that validates what I was just going to say, because what I support people in doing is creating a structured, basically scientific testing approach. Mm. to finding out what food you your your body wants to eat and doesn't want to eat. This has nothing to do with dietary guidelines. It has nothing to do with um, the government guidelines or nutritional guidelines. Because when I followed those guidelines, I felt really bad. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think a lot of us would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but that's sort of the dogma that's put out there is like healthy eating. So the shifting, shifting to this idea of what's healthy for me at this particular time and the way to, there's a way to scientifically test it. So for instance, I have a client who told me, well, I'm not sensitive to carbohydrates. And I said, well, how do you know if you've never tested? Mm -hmm. She was going on this assumption, which is a nice one to have, but yeah. until you test it and, and eliminate it and, and do it in a very kind of controlled way, and not just sort of haphazard, but like a very, a very um, kind of, um, you're collecting data. And pain is data. So for me, an example is, you know, I went through a period of testing eggs because I had eliminated certain things and it still wasn't giving me relief. And of all things, eggs were widespread pain. Of all things. So I cut them out for a year and it was egg whites, not egg yolks. <laughs> Wow. Right? I mean, of all things. Very specific. And so my body was saying, I don't want this for you. I tested it a year later and it was fine. So my body said, okay, whatever had shifted, changed, or healed, I can eat eggs now. So, you know, that's not a guideline in any book or article in a magazine about nutrition. This is mm -hmm. my body giving me that data. And I encourage everyone to do that. You know, t test your assumptions about what foods are okay to eat and not okay. And um, so I help people with that. And there's a lot of information about that. It'd be very confusing for people. And it can also be, um, it's not about deprivation. It's not about, um, you know, I don't get to have that food that everybody else gets to have. It's about what is my body saying it wants and making right. that mindset shift is the most important thing. And I love this idea too, Michelle, of pain being data. Yes. Because I think we think a lot of times we think of pain as just like this horrible experience that we have to go through and not a signal from our body that like, you know, you shouldn't be eating egg whites <laughs> or whatever yes. it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's really different than the medical model. It's really um, shifting to this idea that we can have a conversation with our body. Mm. There's data. Mm -hmm. It's before I went to that mindset shift, I felt like, why is this happening to me? Why does my body feel like it's punishing me? I felt like I was being tortured by my body. And I, I mean, I guess that's a natural process. And you go to the doctor, it better and that doesn't that didn't work out for me and I just when I made this shift of like all right I'm gonna listen to what you're telling me you need and I'm going to be a um, detective and nobody's telling me what to do so I have to figure it out with you my body we'll do this together you know that's a whole different way of thinking about it yeah absolutely I love that. Yeah. I love that so much. And I think a lot of us, yeah, start in that place with our bodies. Like, why are you torturing me? Um, and that's yeah, the thing terrible. that I support people with in my heal in my work too, is, is making that mindset shift. And yeah. you see what happens. Do things happen when you do that with people? Things oh, open yeah. up for them, possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It opens up a lot of possibility. Yeah.
a very different thing. My sense, I don't have any research on this, but my sense is that it's also that shift in how you approach your body is one way to reduce stress on the nervous system mm -hmm. because now you're not fighting yourself mm. mentally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah just, saves a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah, right? You're not doing yeah. battle every day. Yeah. So, okay, so we talked about inflammation and we talked about like that kind of scientific validation of mm -hmm. everything going in. Um, the other part is about the nervous system. And I love this part because when our central nervous systems are activated and, and you know, let's face it, most people in our culture are dealing with some kind of heightened stress constantly. There's this low level sort of cultural hum of stress and illnesses from that. But when and you have- The current political climate doesn't help. Gosh. I just got rid of my TV because I need to, you know, de-stress because it was just too much. I love it. Oh, yeah. But I'm sorry, I continue. Nervous. No, this is a good one because it's so, you know, somebody was asking me like, aren't you bored? I'm like, no, it's so peaceful in my mind. It's, <laughs> it's a different thing in my mind. Oh, and I choose when I get the news. I choose, you know, how to consume it now instead of someone Anyway, um, so the nervous system, the very cool thing is that we have tools built into our system, our nervous system, and when we know how to use them, we can access a very calming place that is useful for so many things, including healing, including pain, including I'm going to call it, I guess, self-hypnosis. And some okay. people get um, sort of um, confused by the word hypnosis. You can go in and program your mind, your experience, to have a better experience, to have, let's say you're making a change in your diet and it's feeling challenging. You can go into this special mind experience I'm going to go into and you can give yourself programming that this will be an easy transition and it won't be hard for you. And I did this when I was going gluten-free mm. and I did this when I was going sugar-free and I eat, a, I eat a very austere diet and I have, I mean, it gets boring, but I don't struggle with it. You know, it's a tool and it's also a tool that can help trigger um, experiences in the body that are very healing and relaxing. So I'm good. I, I made a set of slides. I mean, it's not really a set of slides. I made a document for people. Okay. And Noel, um, did you upload it to Google? Yeah, I'm sharing it in the comments right now for people. Okay. So for anyone that wants to go get that document, it's going to be very helpful to have a visual um, because I can't um, do screen sharing. So what this is, it's, it's very brief. It's like one or two pages, and it's about brain waves. And the really cool thing about brain waves, I'm going to open my version here. This is the one. Oh, I had to close it because I sent it to you. Um, the very cool talk about brain waves, and brain waves are, our brain gives off electrical energy okay and that can be measured by scientists with equipment uh -huh. and what they have found is that there are different frequencies of brain waves and they call it hertz mm -hmm. and i'm not going to go into all the technical stuff about it but so there are the different frequencies of brain waves how, when we are in those brainwave states, we experience the world in a different way. And we naturally go through different brainwave states throughout the day and throughout the night. This is a natural flow. Every 90 minutes or so, we're going through a different set of brainwaves. And then at night, we go through. And I'm just going to spell out briefly. So like awareness, 
where we're going to pay the bills and we got to make a list and we're going to make sure certain things are taken care of is beta. That's like our ordinary daily consciousness. Mm -hmm. The challenge with beta is if we stay too much in beta, it can be associated with worry, stress, anxiety, and a weakened immune system. Got it. So that's where really a lot of fascinating. us are stuck. We're stuck on beta. Yes. I believe our culture is stuck on beta. Mm -hmm. That's my theory. And there's reasons for that, which relate to the whole idea that our culture prefers logic over intuition, right? For sure, yeah. I talk about a lot. Yeah, do you? Yeah. Yeah, in your work? Yeah, I just led a workshop on developing our intuition because we don't ever get a chance to do that growing up. Um, yeah. But sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I'm just, I'm right there with you. You didn't interrupt. <laughs> this, actually feeds into, this actually feeds into it because our school system trains us to be in beta. Because if you daydream and they say, stop daydreaming, pay attention, they're basically saying, get back in beta. <laughs> mm, interesting. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, get back in beta. The interesting thing is that when we shift into alpha, which is more of a meditative, relaxed state, uh -huh. and the brain waves get longer, that's actually a super learning brainwave state. And you can actually enhance your memory in that state. Hmm. And so stop daydreaming is like pushing you out of the natural learning alpha state that is better than beta. So, you know, the school is down, but maybe they'll change when they listen to this. I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. This is why I love talking about this so much because it relates to cu our culture. It relates to so many things. It relates to healing. It relates to intuition, decision making, everything. When you understand your brainwave states and what they feel like, right? So, so meditation, relaxation. It's peaceful. The anxiety falls away. You feel tran tranquil and calm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how do people get into this state? It's natural, right? We naturally daydream. We can only focus in a concentrated way, maybe 20, 30 minutes, right? Like when do you start daydreaming? You know, think about times in your lecture or you're doing something focused. Maybe it's a half hour, maybe it's 45 minutes, but most people start daydreaming at a certain point. So know that that's natural. Okay, so do you have any questions about those two before I go on, jo Noelle? Uh, no, I just want to know how to be in um, in alpha more of the time. <laughs> yes, good. Like, That's awesome. like if I'm if I'm meditating and I see that I'm creeping into into beta, how do I like? Do you have recommendations for for getting me out? Yes, yes, I love that. Okay, so. I guess what I want to say about alpha too is like, because it's a natural thing our brains do when we, when we do routine things, we slip into alpha. Mm -hmm. So if you ever drive somewhere and you say, I'm taking the exit to get home, but you find yourself at home, you know, you, you get this like road trance, they call yeah. it, right? So that's alpha. Or if you're reading a really good book and you lose track of time or watching a really good movie and you lose track of time these are common ways so like a lot of people i i think a lot of people try to relax in ways that bring them into alpha anyway like watching television or you know watching like it, it can also be sort of an agitated relaxation if you're watching the news you can get in a trance about the news and mm -hmm. about crisis and stuff like that so if you're going to be using television or entertainment to relax, I suggest be very wary and aware of what, your, what the content is. Because now in alpha, your subconscious is opening up to suggestions. Mm -hmm. So think about this, right? You're watching something and then they show a food commercial or they show and he, this is why marketers love television because you're in alpha. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's perfect. Right. We're like, ooh, that pizza looks good. 
right and the steam is coming off and it's like you see it in 3d and like your senses are heightened so they're anchoring a suggestion for you mm -hmm. when when you're watching television and the other thing to be careful of you know there's a lot of medical marketing now on television the other thing to be careful of like i've noticed there's like news segments will come on about get the flu shot or there'll be like a news segment about some medical issue and it's always fear-based and it's always anxiety producing. Yeah. So be very um, like, I, I talk back when I was watching television more, I would talk back to the news because if you don't, those suggestions are gonna get anchored into your mind um, without, so I just wanna stop there cause that's a, like a big idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to take a moment too to just say hi to the people that are viewing and say, if you have questions for Michelle about, um, about chronic pain in general or about the brain waves that she's been discussing, um, please put your, put your questions in the comments and, um, I will pass them along so that she can address them. Yeah. Um, because I can't see the questions or who's on with us. Yeah. I don't know. But why, I, but I will, I can't I'll see. pass them along when they come up. Okay. So um, I don't want to stay too long on the alpha. You, you asked about how to get into alpha. I'm going to answer it by talking about how to get into theta. Okay. Because yeah, the there's two one. more kinds of brain waves, right? At least. Yeah. And, and so I'll just quickly go over the two more kinds. So there's theta and delta. Theta is a, the deeper than alpha. And it's associated with intuition. It's associated with, uh, like, people usually feel like they're floating. They, you can feel these sort of body, um, I guess they call them hallucinations, but it's, it's really not a hallucination. It's real. But you can have these floaty sensations and time shifts, this, the perception of time. And imagery can come to you. This is where sort of the subconscious comes into play. And it's not, it doesn't have to fit logic. And it's really great, it's a great state to go into to ask intuitive questions. So if you want to communicate with your body on a really kind of intuitive level about what it wants you to know, go into theta, go into, and it's a, it's a wonderful um, feeling. It's the feeling you get when you are aware that you're not sleeping and you're not awake. Mm -hmm. You know that feeling? Yeah, definitely. It's a nice place yeah. to be. And, yeah, and it feels so, it feels transitory, but it doesn't have to be because there's a skill in getting there and staying there whenever you want, which I'll talk about in a moment. But first, I'm going to talk about the next one, which is Delta, which okay. is about that's the deep sleep, not the transitional. That's more like the deep sleep. And it's, um, they say it's the healing sleep and the rejuvenation, and it's really great for immune, immune system and restoring your health. Now, if you have a sleep disorder, like I did, you may not be getting enough delta. And so practicing going into theta can help you with insomnia, can help you with um, I don't know if it can help you stay in delta. I actually am not going to make that claim. But I would think if we're practicing going into alpha and theta easily. So um, just want to pause and ask if there are any, if you have any questions or if anybody's asking questions about this. Yeah, you just broke up a little bit on my side. So you said you would think that if you spend more time going into theta and um, alpha, then it would be easier to get into delta. Is that what you said? Yeah, I don't know for sure. Um, I it seems like it would be to me because you're practicing, you're practicing, kind of making those shifts at will yeah. anyway. But I don't, I can't make that claim. It just would seem to be true. Um, okay. I do know that if you practice going into theta, you're basically practicing falling asleep in that light sleep. So right. if you have insomnia, you know that's a great thing to practice. Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm curious, like, 
you know, I can't just push like a Delta button and a Theta button. So, so how, how do we practice this? Michelle? I love that idea that we had like a Delta Theta button. That would be, so I like to say that it's kind of like going downtown. You can get there by bus. You can get there by train. You can get there by car. You could take a, a plane. There's a lot of ways to get to Theta. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to get my little list so that I make sure. Um, let me just turn off my phone. Okay. So this is, this is one of the thing. Okay. I'm going to just go down like some of the, some of the, um, ways to get in there. Okay. People are familiar with meditation. That's, um, that's a common way to get there, but a lot of people are intimidated by meditation. Mm -hmm. And what I want to say is if you practice it, you're doing it right. Even if you don't feel like you're doing it right. Because Great. eventually, <laughs> you know, three minutes a day, eventually you will start to feel that transition. And mm -hmm. it, you can't force it to shift into, you know, theta. But, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people stop before they reap the benefits of it. So I just want to put that out there to people, but I'm not into shooting anybody. If it does, if you're forcing it, you don't need to force it. Yeah. There's also um, self hypnosis is a way to get there. Mm -hmm. You can go to a hypnotist. You can do self hypnosis with um, audio tapes. So that's a great way. And again, if you don't have a good a good result that feels like people often say well i didn't go deep first of all you may not be aware of how deep you went because your memory changes when you're in theta you may have gone deeper than you thought second of all if you're if you're mentally struggling with the idea of going deep that's not a relaxed way to experience it so you know um it's like beta in your way into theta <laughs> Which won't get you there. Yeah. Beta in your way will keep you in beta. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I've seen that in action. <laughs> you have? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people beat themselves up a lot. That's what I hear. Like, oh, you know, I didn't do it right. Well, just trying it meant you did it right. And just try again. Because yeah. you're not going to learn to play the violin the first time you pick it up. You know? Right. There's sort yeah. of an expectation people have that I think is unrealistic. That they're supposed to be automatically good at this you do get better and it gets you basically create a groove and like now when i try to go into theta with my meth the methods i like it's so easy but you know it's it's time that's all it is is time and how long and, have you been practicing michelle well you know i should have been doing it much longer because i've been a trained hypnotist and i've been missing out all these years i have to say i would say i really started two years ago okay and i spent you know time every day and then it started to feel really good and i just i just was drew meditating and you know listening to certain types of music that help us get there too so that's that's sort of the other thing i want to talk about which is like if you're struggling there's a kind of music called brainwave entrainment music or binaural beats. Mm. And that's a big word, but what it is is it, there's a certain, it's a special kind of music. When you put the headphones on, there's frequencies that cause your brain to entrain, which means match up with the music. So even if you, even if you feel like it's a struggle for you to get there, it's my favorite way to do it. I love meditating anyway, but um, I love certain kinds of music. And then another way to get there is like drumming, go to a drum circle. Mm -hmm. Most people eventually are going to be in a theta state. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I hope people like drum circles. That. Yeah. That's a trance inducing there. And the drummers play rhythms and then they're entrained into this relaxed state. Mm -hmm. um and chanting can do it so certain you know certain kinds of chants and the the rhythm of the chant 
is a certain frequency and your brain follows the frequency. Got it. That's why chanting feels so good. That makes sense. It is. And that's why certain meditation practices use chanting because for if people are struggling, the chanting will get them kind of in yeah. it. And I don't know if I'm leaving anything out. Um, I mean, there's probably like, there's probably like popular music that does it. Like, I, I don't, I wouldn't think that's a stretch to say that. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, there's probably all kinds of ways, you know, like um, anything that's like a hum, even I have found myself going into a trance. I don't, I don't know if it's theta, but like when there's like bees and crickets, mm -hmm. you know, like train, the sounds of nature, like rushing water, there's like a rhythm, mm. the rushing water and the bees and the crickets. And like there's a certain, and then there's like a certain sort of pitch. There's like a chord, there's like a, there's like a drone tone. And then the, or, or, or. I don't know, I get really into it. That's like, I geek out about this stuff. And I listen to um, cricket recordings. I kid you not. <laughs> I've heard about there are cricket. I've heard about bee recordings and how that's been really healing for people. So I believe it. Yes, bee recordings, cricket recordings, waterfalls. There's so much out there. So I kind of covered a lot of technical information, but um, yeah, I, I'd love to ask you, Michelle. Like, how do you support people in your work to um, to develop these kinds of practices? So I train them how to go into theta. That's like the first thing. Yeah. Train theta. It's so easy. It's relaxing. You're going to get a better night's sleep and you're going to feel better. Like that's the, that's like, that's like feel better 101. Yeah. And then the training is the next part of the training is how to create a suggestion for yourself mm -hmm. so that you can go once you're in the theta state, it's such a great tool. You can actually dial down the pain. Your, your brain will listen to instructions you give it when you're in the theta state. And you can say, I want you to dial down the intensity or the volume or however we frame it. Mm -hmm. I want you to take it from a nine to a seven. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah, and I'm curious, like, as, you know, a yoga teacher and, uh, you know, someone who does meditation, is that something that um, you have to practice every day and then in, it to, in order to get the benefit in the moment, or can you practice it just whenever you're in pain? Like, how, how does that work? I think when you're in pain, it's just, pain can be distracting to learn a new skill. Yeah. If you're having a good day, that's a time to practice something new because you're not, you know, some, some hypnotists say pain is its own trance and that it can become this sort of self-fulfilling feedback loop. In addition to what I said about the nervous system, which is sort of like a physical thing, some people say it's a mental trance because it's so captivating. Mm. So I, I don't really, I don't really have a take statement. I play with that idea. If pain's a trance, that means I can get out of that trance. Interesting. Right? Yeah, and I imagine that with different people, you recommend different things, right? Depending on what their pain is and how they're experiencing it and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely, and everybody has a different um, system of imagination. So some people are more verbal, some are more visual, some are kinesthetic. Like if you're working with people that do yoga, it's probably a lot of kinesthetic people. So you're going to develop, you know, um, depending on who you are, you're going to develop a set of self suggestions that fit with who you are. Mm -hmm. And you can, you, you know, it, it can be very customized, but I have to tell you, I did a workshop with a group, a room full of like 40 people. And I did a, uh, a little, a, a sort of little mini pain demonstration of dialing it down. And somebody that had had um, severe ankle injury for years, was in pain for years, 
just from that felt relief. And wow. it was a group. It wasn't customized. So is there is a variety of ranges of suggestibility. So that person was highly suggestible, mm -hmm. which just means imaginative. That's all it means. When you can take in a suggestion, it basically means you're using your imagination vividly. Yeah. Right. But that's a skill. So if you find that challenging, all you got to do is practice it. Don't be intimidated. If it doesn't come, come right away, I just want to say that to people. A lot of people feel like, well, it won't work for me. Right. You know, I can't be hypnotized. You just try. You just relax. Just, just, I like to say play with it. And I like to say pretend. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great word, right? Like pretend it's not hard. Pretend it's easy. Yeah. Or pretend that it's working. Pretend that it's working. I like that one. Yes. Pretend it's working. Or what if it was working? Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. that does is it gets us out of beta, right? The logical mind that wants proof. And we're right. like, well, I'm just going to pretend. So I don't need to, I don't need to satisfy beta. I'm just going to play an alpha and pretend. And then maybe, you know, maybe see if I get to, you know, you don't even have to know what level you're in. Like, I'm just laying that out for people to talk about the healing of each level, but you don't need to figure out, am I in theta? Right. You know, that's not something. That's just how do. it's working on the back end. Yeah. 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 And then, um, so how does this, how does this support people over time, Michelle? I mean, does, can practicing this mean that somebody can go from being a nine to being, you know, pain free on a day to day basis? Or is it more like pain management or like, how does it sort of, shake out for folks? Well, um, so the first thing I want to say is that we don't want to get rid of all pain because, and it presents, it prevents us from being damaged physically. That's and true. If, yeah. It's a signal right? that we need. It is a signal we need. So, um, you never want to eliminate pain completely and you never want to eliminate pain if you have a condition, there's a, and I don't know the name of this condition, there's a condition where people have, um, they're easily damaged because they're, because they don't have the bone structure. And I, I don't actually know the name of it. So you have to really work with your doctor on this. This is, this doesn't have to be an either or thing. Mm -hmm. You need to, you need to know that it's okay in your case to have pain reduction. So um, I don't like to say pain elimination. Okay. But you can mute the pain, right? So like, you know, you, I had a sciatica flare up a few weeks ago and I could mute the pain, which meant I was still aware of it mm -hmm. because I don't want to cause damage. I have, a, I have a balance. I want to be aware of what's happening there. Right. right? You wouldn't want to like make it worse by not feeling it and doing something yeah. crazy with your body or yeah, that makes sense. I want to know if I'm moving it in a way I shouldn't or something like that. So, um, I like to do it in stages with people okay. and, um, work with their doctor. <clears throat> it's very important. And I also want to say, I want to take a moment to say, um, how important it is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for me, it was important to get off of my pain meds because they were causing really bad side effects. And for anyone that wants to get off of pain meds, especially Lyrica, Cymbalta, the SSRIs, those, you cannot just stop taking them. Yeah, I learned that the hard because way. If you did? <laughs> okay. Yeah. It can be bad. Yeah, I'm glad right? you're saying that. Yep. It can be a crisis. And to do it in a way that's safe and gradual. And so learning this skill can be helpful. Um, it doesn't have to be either or, you know, mm -hmm. I want to say that. And I also want to say, if you're considering taking any of those prescriptions and you have not yet started taking them, mm -hmm. I really want to encourage people to do the research because once you're on those drugs, you can be, I know people that have taken years to get off of them. Mm -hmm. And I want to refer people to um, a website, Kelly Brogan, MD, Dr. Kelly Brogan. She helps people wean off of those drugs. And she used to prescribe them. 
And then she, cause she was in that paradigm of the medical model and mm. drugs are supposed to help people. And what she saw went against her training and she had the courage and uh, to be honest about what she was seeing and to change her way of working. I re I really respect her a lot. And so if you're considering those drugs or if someone is, is encouraged, she has, she has a blog post called informed consent. And her idea is that we are not, being given informed consent when it comes to mind altering drugs. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's so true in my case. Her. It is. She's amazing. I follow her. She's amazing. Um, that was true in my case. I didn't know what I was getting into. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. And it caused damage. To, I mean, I don't know if you feel like it caused damage. Uh, yeah, well, certainly um, a lot of emotional distress that I didn't need to go to. And yeah, I, yeah, I just, I wish that somebody had told me what I was getting into and not just be like, this is the answer. This will make you feel better. <laughs> like that's right. all I got basically. Yeah. And you need to feel better. You want to feel hope. That was a long and winding road for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're on the same page about that. So, <clears throat> Those are the elements, basically, sort of an outline in terms of theta, learning to program yourself, and reducing inflammation with this sort of scientific strategy, which is the beta brainwave state. So, like, there's a usefulness yeah. to let's collect data, let's look at it, right? Like, yeah. So, using all of the brainwave states is fun. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for the for the overview of that, Michelle. I think it's going to be really supportive for a lot of people. And um, yeah. I, I just want to encourage the folks that are watching, again, if you have questions for Michelle, please type them in the comments below so that I can share them with her. Um, but uh, Michelle, just because we're getting a little bit low on time, I'd love to ask you if people want to work with you, how does that work? How do they get in touch with you? What does that look like? Well, I offer anyone that's interested um, a no obligation consultation. So feel free right. to just reach out to me, ask questions, and it's not about selling you on anything. It's about seeing if you, if I can help you and it's a good fit. I mean, no pressure. I'm not into pressure. And they can reach me on Facebook. And my Facebook page is Michelle Aubin Self Healing Now or they can reach out to my personal page. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I wanna sort of leave everybody with this sort of idea of the paradigm of healing and sort of what we're told. And um, I feel like we're not being told the truth, which is that you can recover from arthritis, you can heal from painful illness. Come across stories all the time of people who have healed and i want to mention a few other doctors that have healed themselves without yeah. medications even though they were trained to dispense medications and there's a couple of people to you know really they're like my mentors in a way and um you know i'm always i'm always reading their information because it's right in line with my experience and so i mentioned kelly brogan she's been upfront about some of her health issues and she did not take medication. She went holistic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Joe Dispenza, he's kind of a well known, oh, yeah. right? He had a back injury, serious accident. And he used mental imagery and self hypnosis to repair his own back. He was not going to accept a lifetime of pain and, and disability, basically. So you can read his story on Amazon, probably has a website. Uh, I find that very inspiring. There's Dr. Terry Walls, that's W-A-H-L-S. Mm -hmm. She had MS, she was in a wheelchair. She wrote a book standing on her wheelchair on the cover because she completely recovered using nutrition and other holistic methods. So she was, you know, that's amazing. And then a lot of people have heard of Mark Hyman, Dr. Hyman. Mm -hmm. He 
had chronic fatigue. He didn't take pills and he healed. So that's just like a short list of people that have been through it. Yeah. And not taking the medications that were prescribed, you know, not done that, that route. And they completely recovered. That is inspiring. Yeah. I love, I love the walls protocol. So just, just to recap for folks. So that's, um, Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Kelly Brogan, Joe Dispenza and, um, Terry walls. Terry walls. Yeah. Great. Great. And I and also, I also recommend Bruce Lipton as sort of reading. He, I don't think he had an illness he overcame, but he was a cell biologist and he kind of came up with this idea. He noticed the way cells interacted and communicated with each other. And so he's got this, he wrote the book Biology of Belief, mm. which is all about how our belief system and self-talk actually affects our cells. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard a little bit about that. It's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, great. Well, any anything else that you want to share with folks, Michelle, before we jump off? Um, yeah, talk to your body, you know. Um, talk to your body and listen. And um, look into these doctors i know when you're i know when you're struggling it can be hard to do research when i was really sick it was hard to go online and things but um be careful who you listen to and be careful who you get your nutritional advice from and um question everything people tell you about healing and about nutrition and about what's possible for you that's sort of what i that's sort of the bottom line question it Question everything I said. Don't take my word for it. You know, well, and then true. when people are in that questioning state, I know sometimes too they can be like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what feels right. Like, do you have recommendations for folks on how they figure out what is right for them in their bodies? Yes. Go into Alveda. That's like anxiety, logic. I need to figure it all out. If you can find a way to just go into that calm state for five minutes, put on a meditation audio and just give yourself that sort of brain calm. You don't have to figure it out right this minute. Just give yourself that space mm -hmm. and just exist in that space and feel good for a minute. Mm. And in that space is when I ask my intuition, I'll say, okay, what do I need to know right now? And then I might be led to a website or I might be led to something or an idea pops in my head. Why don't you try this? Okay, yeah. Okay. So I have like this conversation. You do too? Yeah, I've started doing that in the last six months. And um, but getting what I've what I've noticed and I've told other people this too is getting calm first is really important because if you try to ask your intuition when you're in, I guess when you're in beta, it just like, it's not helpful. You're just like, I don't know. And I don't know why I don't know. I can get worse. So it's not helpful because you're getting um, sort of logic spin. It's like a word cloud. Right. right. And that's how beta is like, I got to find the solution right now. I got to figure it all out. And you just go, okay, we just go sink in. And then you don't even, when you go to that state, you don't need the answer right away. Right. That's the other piece is like, you don't, you don't need to, I ha you don't have to figure it out in this five minutes. Right. Right. Yeah, I just I, I I found that, too, that just asking the question, even if you don't get an answer right away, you're putting it out there and you might get one the next time you sit down and quiet your mind or when you're yes. walking the dog or driving to work or whatever, like it could come to you at any point. But it doesn't doesn't hurt to put it out there. Put it out there when you're relaxed. Yeah. 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 yeah, well, this has been so great, Michelle. I really appreciate you taking the time to share all this with folks. And um, can you say one more time where people can find you on Facebook if they want to work with you? Self Healing Now is my business page. Okay. And Michelle Aubin is my personal page. Okay. Those are the two easiest ways. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thank you so, so much. Well. And I hope we talk again soon. I do too. Great talking with you. All right. Take good care. Bye, everybody.